Good evening. Go ahead and grab your Bibles and open them up this evening to Romans uh, chapter 6. Be looking at verses 15 to 19 tonight. I'm calling this message Slave. You see, that's kind of a peculiar name for a, a sermon, but you, you'll find out why once we get to the text. Uh, this past week, we celebrated uh, the 4th of July, our nation's uh, independence uh, on Thursday. Uh, we enjoy as a nation uh, certain freedoms and liberties that most people in the world will never get the exp uh, opportunity to experience. And as you know, if you haven't looked around or haven't traveled abroad, that, that in reality, that our nation is the envy of the world in many rest, uh, aspects. That's why so many people all over the world want to come here, <laughs> either legally or illegally. Right? There's a reason for that. And so even though we enjoy uh, many freedoms and opportunities as Americans, uh, we are still slaves from a biblical, biblical perspective. And I think we don't like to think of it that way. All humans are. And you would ask the question, well, Brother Mike, why would you say that? Or, 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 or how exactly are we slaves? In our own minds, like, we'll say, well, I'm a free person. Uh, nobody owns me. Uh, you know, I'm free to, to be and do whatever I want to do and free to, to go pretty much wherever I want to do with, within the law, right? And that makes sense that people would, would think that way. You see, those things are true from you know, a limited perspective, but there's another perspective that we must also consider, a deeper reality at work within each one of us. You see, if you read your Bibles, you'll come to realize that the Bible declares that we're either slaves of sin or we're slaves of Christ. That's, that's, that's it. That's your two options. The only two options available to us are a slave of sin or a slave of Christ. That we are either drawn to obedience or drawn to disobedience. We're either drawn to sinfulness or we're drawn to righteousness. We're either partakers of darkness or partakers of light. There is no neutral position of your heart. There simply is not one. To not choose to trust in Jesus is the same thing as rejecting Jesus. And to reject Jesus is to choose to remain in bondage to your sin and to remain under God's righteous condemnation. That you can repent of your sins and place your faith in Christ and become a slave of Christ. You can do that tonight. Here in this place. And receive reconciliation and grace. Complete forgiveness of your sins. To be reconciled back to God. Receive the gift of eternal life. Or you can do nothing. You can do nothing. And remain a slave to sin. Remain under God's wrath. Await God's eternal judgment. And await your eternal condemnation. But what you cannot do. Is remain indifferent. About Christ. No one will be in heaven. Against their will. And no one will be in hell against their will either. You either spend all eternity in heaven. Or you'll spend all eternity in hell. Because of the choice that you make. In this lifetime. In regards to Jesus Christ. It's your choice. God gives us this. Free will to make, uh, choice to make. The choice is ours, but so are the consequences to our decisions that we make in the here and now. You see, sometimes I think in my own way, my own pea brain, that sometimes we forget that it wasn't supposed to be like this. So we, all we've known is a fallen world. It's normal to us, but it wasn't intended to be this way. You read in your Bibles and you start out in the book of Genesis and chapter 1 and chapter 2 and everything is great. It was perfect. It was not just good. It was very good <laughs> it is, what, is what God said. Very good. It was, it was perfect. There was no sin. There was no guilt. There was no shame. There was no fear. There were no tears. None of those things. And just like us, God created Adam and Eve with a free will to either obey or disobey. And we know what they did. We know what they chose to do. They were not robots that were programmed to love and obey God. That's not how he designed them. They weren't created that way. But then we know also, when you get to Genesis 3, you read it also. And what happened? They chose to sin, to disobey God. The harmony and the peace between God and humanity was fractured forever. 
Only to be reconciled once when Christ came to reconcile things to himself. All things to himself. You see, the serpent posed this one question. This one question. Did God indeed say? Right? Is that really what God said and the first humans chose to sin against God? It was just that simple. And from that very first bite of the forbidden fruit, whatever it was, we don't know. Apple, who knows? We don't, that, that's irrelevant. Sin and darkness came into the hearts of mankind. And it's been that way ever since. Since the fall of man in the garden, sin has become our natural inclination. That we're born with this sinful nature. When Adam chose to sin against God, he chose sin as his master, enslaving himself and his wife and every human being after him to sin. That one choice caused all of this. That's why we're all born with a sinful nature. We're all born slaves of sin. That's what Paul meant when he wrote in Romans 3.23, right? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Since the fall of Adam, every human baby born has been born a slave to sin all but one, that is. One special baby, a divine baby, the Lord Jesus Christ, and He was born of a virgin so that He would not be born under the curse. And as most of y'all know, we have a new granddaughter. And even my sweet and precious two-month-old granddaughter, Maisie Claire, she too is a slave to sin. Already. Already. And she doesn't even know it yet. But she will put it on display soon enough. You don't have to teach your children to sin. They're born with it. <laughs> you, you don't have to model it for them. They, it's, it's, it's within them to do these things. You see, we're not born with a choice to whether we will sin or not. Adam already chose that for us. The only choice that we have is how long we will, we will remain a slave to sin. How long we will stay in bondage to that sinful nature. The Bible tells us that Jesus came to set the captive free. To set the captive free. Free from the power of sin, but also free from the penalty of sin. So the question is, how have you been set free? How have I been set free? You see, it's not enough to just go through the motions. You see, if you've never been set free, I would ask you to consider your standing with God tonight. To to, to listen to what I have to say, the, what the Lord has given me to share, but examine your own heart. If you've never trusted Christ, then that would be a great night to do that. And I promise you, it will be the best decision that you will ever make. But if you're here tonight and you've already trusted Christ, I want to remind you of something. You are no longer a slave to sin. Stop living like you are. You have a new master. And you can declare with the Apostle Paul that you are a slave of Christ. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. And so what exactly does being a slave of Christ look like? I believe our text will show us. I believe our text will show us three characteristics of a slave of Christ. A slave of Christ will despise sin, desire obedience, and delight in holiness. And so that's what our text will show us. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them. And stand as we honor the reading of God's word together. Romans chapter 6 verses 15 to 19. Paul poses, begins with this question. He says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to? Obey. You are that one slave whom you obey whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. This is the word of God. Father, we thank you for this opportunity, this blessing, this privilege. Every time we're able to gather in this place, it's a blessing and a privilege. Every time we're under your word, it's a blessing and a privilege. So God, we ask that you would teach us your word tonight. Help us to realize who we are in Christ. 
And then there's only two possibilities for everyone in this room. Either we are slaves of sin, in bondage to sin, condemned to an eternal hell righteously because of the sin that we've committed against you, or we're slaves of Christ. That we've been bought with a price. The precious blood of Jesus. And so, Father, I pray that you would teach us tonight, help us to, to examine our hearts, not, not what we would say that we are, or what we would think that we are, but as we look at this passage and we examine our own lives, who are we according to your word? Thank you again, God, for your word. Thank you for your spirit. We thank you for Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The first thing that we notice in our text is that a slave of Christ will despise sin. We see this right there in, in, in verse 15. It says, What then shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? And with Paul is emphatically with a certainly not. There was this, this crazy notion that just because we are our sins are forgiven by grace and grace abounds where sin abounds that some would say, well, let's sin more so more grace can be bestowed upon me. He said, that's insane. Why would you even think that way? Why would you even think that would be the right thing to do that you would continue to sin or, or sin more so you'd receive more grace? Certainly not is what Paul would say. You see, sin is a killer. That's it, plain and simple. It's a killer. This quote by Puritan preacher John Owens is, the pure truth. He says, be killing sin or it will be killing you. That's it. There, there's, there's only one winner here. Be killing sin or it will be killing you. That sin is the single most devastating and degenerating power that has ever entered into human history. For a Christian to continue to practice the sins that they have been set free from made absolutely no sense to the Apostle Paul and it shouldn't make any sense to us either. We shouldn't accept it as normal and just write it off and say, well, you know, that's just, that's how it is. You know, I'm a sinner saved by grace and I'm in the sanctification process and so just bear with me. I mean, there's some truth to that. I mean, we are at different levels. We are different stages of growth and all those things. But sometimes where we should be mature, we should be past these things, we're still there. And we're allowed to still be there because nobody holds us accountable. There's no expectations of growth. Still babies and infantiles in the faith. Think about sometimes when we don't understand what we've been set free from or, we're, or we choose to go back into the sin that we've been set free. It's kind of like an inmate on death row being pardoned but still choosing execution. I know I've been set free, but I, I choose this instead. Apparently some of the Christians there in Rome were still living in open immorality and other sinful practices that they understood that they were not uh, saved by keeping the law, that, that Paul was emphatic about that. It's not about doing good things that save you. But they didn't even bother with God's law anymore. They just kind of set it aside and said, this doesn't really matter what we do. We're, we're under grace, so anything goes. But you see, this again is the age-old debate that we've had to experience even in our day. Is it righteousness through works or righteousness through grace alone? Of course, the Bible tells us it's through grace alone. that we don't, We're not saved by our good works, but, but our good works are evidence that we have been saved. That's what the Scripture would tell us. You see, the Apostle Paul was once a Pharisee of Judaism. Before he got saved, we know this. Judaism had taught that righteousness came through a strict keeping, keeping of the law. Uh, which began with the Ten Commandments, but then grew to over 600. Over 600 uh, 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 man-made spiritual commandments, uh, religious add-ons, if you will, updates to the law. And then depending on your own keeping of all the laws of righteousness before God, well, if, you, if you depend on doing the right things or keeping the rules, as, as many of us try to do, it's for the wrong reason. That's known as legalism. And legalism does not save anyone. Legalism is self-righteousness, and self-righteousness is not acceptable before God. You see, if sinful humans were capable of atoning for their own sins by doing good things, then Jesus Christ died for nothing. Absolutely nothing. There was no purpose for Him to come. Jesus' death was cruel and completely unnecessary. But you see, we also know this because the Scripture makes it clear. Sinful men cannot atone for sinful men. Like the bloods and bulls of goats was not sufficient to atone for our sins. Only a sinless, 
man can atone for sinful men. And that's where God's grace comes into play for all of us. That grace is not getting what we deserve. That we all deserve eternal punishment in hell because of our sins. But God chose instead to extend us grace. To extend us grace instead by giving us Jesus Christ, His one and only Son, to be punished in our place. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us this, For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And I'm no different than you. I've had to grow and I'm still growing. And many Christians, I think they wrestle with the concept of God's grace. You know, how to apply it to your life. What does it mean? And that some mistake, make the mistake of abusing grace as a covering for continual sinfulness. I've already talked about some. In Christ, all sins have been forgiven. That's what the Bible teaches. Past sins, uh, uh, present sins, and even future sins. Sins you haven't even thought about yet have been covered under the blood. God's grace does cover our sins, but God's grace does not give us a license to keep on sinning. That's what happens in many cases. We'll make excuses and say it's not that big of a deal. I'm forgiven, so what's the big deal? And I would just say this, if that describes you tonight, you do not understand grace at all. You do not understand grace at all, and I would warn you that you are playing a very dangerous game with God. It's true that we are saved by grace and we're kept saved by grace. And I'm so thankful for that because if, if we could lose our salvation, we would. Beginning with me. But we're not. We're saved by grace and kept saved by grace. Yet a true follower of Jesus persists, if a true believer persists in, unrepentant, uh, or in unrepentance and sin, the Lord in His grace can and will intervene. I promise you that. We see this also in the Scriptures. The first thing that we'll experience when we sin or continue in sin is chastisement. It's discipline. It's, it's spanking. That, that, that God doesn't really buy into these newfangled parenting techniques. He doesn't threaten. He doesn't count to three. right? He doesn't put you in a corner and just kind of you know, let you think about what you did or write an essay or whatever strange thing that's going on nowadays. Hebrews 12, 5, 5 to 8 says this, he says, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are, not, or if you, but if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Be thankful when you're convicted of your sins. Be thankful whenever you can't sleep at night because you're so burdened with the guilt and the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your life to turn you from the sin that is destroying you. That's just the first step. If that doesn't work, if that doesn't get your attention, then it'll take it to a, a deeper, more harsh, I guess you would say, step. The next step, if we won't repent or won't return to the Lord after that, the next step is the destruction of the flesh. Some, some believers go home to be with the Lord way sooner than they should have simply because they would not repent. We see this in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 4 and 5. It's the Paul, Apostle Paul again. It says, In the name of our, our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one, this is an unrepentant brother, unwilling to repent, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That's pretty heavy. We don't like to think about things like this. We have our own notion and try to, you know, try to paint God out, to make Him out to be the kind of God we want Him to be instead of the, the God that the Bible declares Him to be. You see, we have a responsibility to call for our fallen brothers and sisters to repent. Repent of the sin that's enslaved them once again. Don't ignore it. Don't turn the other way. Don't, don't just make excuses like we so often do. And then we pray. We pray that God will convict them and turn them back to Him. Turn their hearts back. 
to Him that they would repent of their sins. You see, when we understand the seriousness of a Christian's refusal to repent, destruction of the flesh, and even death is an act of God's grace. It's an act of God's grace. It's not mean. It's not cruel. It's grace that God will not allow that sinning brother or sister to bring shame and reproach on Jesus Christ or His church. He will not allow it to continue. You see, if you do not despise your sin enough to repent of it, the Lord will simply bring you home. He will not be mocked. You see, a slave of Christ will despise sin. We will despise sin. Second thing that we notice is that a slave of Christ will desire obedience. We see this in verses 16 and 17. It says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom, to, whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. It's talking about the gospel. The gospel, that faith through grace. grace. Verse 16, Paul gets as clear as he can about who the true master of your life is, right? Regardless of what you claim with your lips, obedience with your actions portrays who your true master is. doesn't matter what you say, what you profess with your mouth, your behavior, your conduct, your actions uh, tell the true story about who you are. You're either, you're either a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. See, what we do has to match up with what we say. That's where the problem rises for so many of us and so many of our brothers and sisters. And maybe even some in this room have been called that H word. Hypocrite. Because we say one thing and we live the opposite. So this is where the hypocrisy really hinders our ability to witness effectively. That we can go to church every time the doors are open. We can have a cross in our front yard with Christmas lights on it year round. We can have t-shirts with Scripture printed on it for every day of the week. And none of that's going to matter if our lives are marked by a pattern of sin and disobedience to Christ. None of that matters. It's a facade. It's fake. It's phony. It communicates that sin is our master and not Christ. It's confusing to say the least. It communicates that we believe Jesus' death and resurrection may have been enough to save our souls from hell, but it wasn't enough to break the hold that sin has over us in this lifetime doesn't make any sense so just like we can choose to sin or not to sin we can also choose to obey god or not to obey god that's again the pros and cons of a free will i wish i wish i wish that god would force me to obey him that he would make me uh, obey his will i want that because i know the mess that i'll make in my own life when i have this free will i mess up all the time i wish he would make me do his will but he does not because he loves us. Paul says, to whom you present yourselves to obey, you are that one slave. Y'all get that? Do you, you understand the reality that, that Paul is presenting here? To whom you present yourself to obey, you are that one's slave. You see, before you were saved, if you are saved, all you were capable of was sinfulness. That's it. That, that was your one direction. That was your one thought pattern to always sinful. Always be sinful. Always disobey the will of God. But now the Holy Spirit of God indwells you and empowers you to live a life of obedience to Him. You see, we glorify God through our obedience, not our disobedience. 1 Corinthians 6.20 tells us, For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, spirit, which are God's. And this brings us back to where we began. About being a slave. If you have trusted Christ, you now belong to Him. You now belong to Him. Down in verse 18, Paul calls all believers slaves of righteousness. In other words, a slave of Christ is also a slave of righteousness. That Jesus paid the ransom for our sin, all of our sin. That Jesus isn't Jesus just isn't just our Savior; He is also our Lord. That's where this obedience has to come from. I remember at one point in Scripture, 
the, the disciples and those that were following after Jesus, they weren't doing what He said. And He said, I don't understand. This is crazy. Why do you keep calling me Lord? Why do you keep saying Lord, Lord, and yet you do not do what I say? That doesn't even make any sense. You keep saying that I'm your Lord, but you don't do what I tell you to do. That's not how the Lord thing works. Lordship means obedience. We must submit ourselves fully to Christ's Lordship over our lives. And let me be as clear as I can. This is not optional. It's, it's not you can if you feel like it or, 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 you know, if it's convenient. If you can get around to doing it, then, you know, then be obedient. It's mandatory. Obedience to Christ leads to righteousness and a life that is pleasing to Christ. Disobedience, on the other hand, to Christ leads to death. There's no nice way to put that. I can't, I can't clean that up. I can't make it any less harsh than it is. This quote by Pastor John MacArthur speaks of the desire of obedience that every Christian should have. He says the old sinful way of life cannot continue to characterize a true Christian. Obedience to God and righteous living is a certainty in the life of a truly saved person. Because of temporary unfaithfulness, Sinful disobedience may at times appear to dominate a Christian's life, but here's the key. But a true believer cannot continue indefinitely in disobedience because it is diametrically opposed to his new and holy nature which cannot endure sinful living. I would also point your attention to verse 17 and note that Paul uses the past tense when he says you were slaves to sin y'all see that past tense word that's that's who you used to be it's not who you are anymore you were slaves to sin you see if you believe the gospel and are born again in christ you have been set free you have been delivered from the shackles of sin and death you are a slave to sin no more that's who you used to be not who you are now nor will you ever be again christ is your master now you obey him and not sin is what Paul would want us to know tonight. A slave of Christ will despise sin and despire, desire obedience. And the third and final thing that we notice in our text is that a slave of Christ will delight in holiness. Verses 18 and 19. It says, having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your, your members as slaves of uncleanness, and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For holiness. You see, before you got saved, you were a world-class sinner, and you didn't even realize it. You say, you, back in one day, in your point in your life, you may have said, I'm not good at anything. I, I beg to differ. You were a great sinner. World-class. Top of the class. Number one grade-A sinner. It came naturally because it was all you were capable of doing as a slave of sin. But everything about your life was lived out apart from the acknowledgement of God and His will for your, and ways for your life. That's all you knew. It's all you were capable of. Instead of the Bible and the Spirit of God leading your life, the world system and demonic forces led your life, kept you blind, kept you enslaved. It's all you knew. And I would just say this. Maybe you didn't, you know, worship the devil. You know, or, or maybe you did. I don't know. I don't know some of you that well. Maybe you used to be a, a, a Satanist. I don't know. But I do know this. You didn't worship Jesus Christ. So it's really the same thing, pretty much. The end result's the same anyway. You see, the greatest deception of the devil was to have people think that they are good and moral people leading good and moral lives. How many, how many good people do you know? How many good and moral people do you know? How many decent people do you know? I know plenty of them. And, and many of them will not even, not even hint at saying they follow Jesus, that they love Jesus, but yet they will say they're a good person, they're good people. You think about good people around our community. Maybe they've never been arrested, never did drugs or alcohol, never even watched a radar movie before. Kept a good job paid all your debts, took care of your family. You see, those are all things and all measuring sticks or measurements that our, our culture would, would say and try to classify someone as being a good person. That's the standard for being a good person, but that's not God's standard. 
That's not. Sinlessness is God's standard. See, here's the problem with all of that. Good people die every day and spend eternity in hell because they never repented of their sins and they never placed their faith in Jesus Christ. Hell is full of good people. Hell of good is full of good people. Slavery to sin can be as obvious as openly worshiping the devil and having 666 tattooed on your forehead or have a t-shirt that says, I heart Satan. You know, it can be as obvious as those things. But for most people, slavery to sin looks just like normal everyday life. Everyday life. You would never know the difference. They work hard, they love their family, and they love their country. But here's a the problem. They don't love Jesus. They don't love Jesus and they do not delight in holiness. You see, life apart from the saving grace of Jesus Christ is a continual downward spiral into more and more darkness. That verse 19 says, For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to what? More lawlessness. More and more. It gets worse and worse. Sinfulness leads to more sinfulness. Darkness leads to more darkness. Disobedience leads to more disobedience. And those are all choices that you make when you are a slave of sin, not when you are a slave of Christ. The new you. The new you delights in holiness. The new you delights in doing what God wants you to do. It's not burdensome or boring to you as some would say. You see, if your life looks no different than those that do not know Christ, it's safe to say that you're not living a life of holiness and righteousness. It should be distinct. It should make you peculiar amongst those who do not know Christ. You should look out of place because you are. You should seem odd or strange because you are. You should have a completely different lifestyle because you serve a completely different master. That's what Paul would want us to know tonight. And so how do we do this? How do we delight in holiness? It begins with us choosing to delight, to delight, to delight in holiness. It's a choice. We have to choose this. We have to want to delight in holiness. The end of verse 19 tells us to present our members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. We're to submit our lives completely to God and His will for our lives. We practice what the Bible preaches. Everything, every bit of it. We don't get to pick and choose. We don't get to buffet style the Bible and say, I'll do this, but not that. I like this, and I don't like that, and so I'll skip over this part and all those things. No. We practice what the Bible preaches. All of it. And we must understand that God has called us to this. God has called us to holiness. God has called us to be holy. It's not optional. Just like obedience. 1 Peter 1, 13-16. Therefore, go, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children. There's that word again. Not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. There it is. You see, we can be assured that if God has called us to live a life of holiness, then we can be assured that He will enable us to live a life of holiness too. He's never going to call us to do something that we're incapable of doing. He's called us to holiness. He expects us to live holy lives. You see, if we find our delight in holiness, we should have no problems choosing to live a life of holiness as well. The slave of Christ will despise sin, desire obedience, and will delight in holiness. So this evening as we close, a couple of questions. I like to close with questions to help us kind of bring things together, make us think things through again. I would just simply ask, have you been set free from the bondage of sin? Have you? Have you become a slave to righteousness? Are you now a slave of Christ? Do you belong to Him? Because if you would just continue reading after our passage, Paul will clear all this up. He'll sum up what the free life in Christ looks like versus the life that's enslaved to Christ. As we look at verses uh, 20 to 23, Romans 6, 20 to 23, he says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have in the things which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. 
But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit and holy, fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. In verse 23, we know this one also well. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what we've learned tonight is that if you have become a slave of Christ, you will, desire, you will despise sin in yourself and in others. In yourself and in others, you'll despise all forms of sin. You also desire obedience. As disobedient Christian, that word in itself is an oxymoron. That's like a, a Christian prostitute. Those, those words just don't even go together. It doesn't even make sense. Neither does a disobedient Christian. But we will also delight in holiness. That we will embrace the strangeness of walking in purity. Right? It is strange. Embrace the strangeness of walking in purity. It's okay to be odd. But see, if you're here tonight and you're still in your sin, you're still a slave to sin, I want to offer you freedom. But more importantly, I want to offer you a new master tonight. A new master. The life without Jesus is no life at all. It really isn't. It's not. The devil is a liar. As I said this morning, he's a liar. He's a trickster. Life without Jesus isn't life. You're just merely existing until physical death hands you over to eternal destruction. But there's hope. You see, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. You can place your faith in Jesus Christ. You can choose a new master tonight. You can choose life tonight. It's your choice. See, freedom for you is as close as your willingness to repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus Christ and His finished work on the cross. How do I know this? How could it be so simple? Because again, the Word of God tells us. Right? Romans 10, 13, we, we love this verse. For, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I'm sitting in a room full of whosoevers. We're all whosoevers. He wants to save all of us. But again, the choice is yours to make. I would invite you to choose wisely because your eternal soul is at stake. Heaven is a real place, but so is hell. And they're both eternal. Let's pray and we'll have a time to respond. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this entire day. For those who've had the, the privilege to be here for everything, to be here for the Sunday school hour as we studied and closed out First Timothy and then this morning as we looked at Ephesians 6 and sharpened our, our skills and expanded our uh, understanding of what uh, spiritual warfare is all about and then the discipleship hour. God, we thank you so much for these gifts to us. And Father, we also thank you for the gift of freedom. Not freedom to do whatever we want to do, but freedom to be able to follow Christ. To be a slave of Christ, to be a slave of God, to be a slave of righteousness. Whatever term we would use here would be appropriate. So God, I pray, I pray, I pray with all my being that this is a room full of slaves. Not of sin, but slaves of Christ. And Father, for if there be one here tonight that does not yet know Christ as Lord and Savior, God, I pray tonight would be that night. That, that you have been working in hearts, that you have been working in minds the entire day, the entire week leading up to this day, this moment in time. So God, I pray that you would do a work, that you would make this a place of salvation tonight. God, thank you again for your love. Thank you for your work, your work in our lives, and thank you for your grace. We thank you most of all for your Son, Jesus Christ. We love you, and we ask these things in His name. Amen.